everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Mike Shields, and I'm a Managing Associate at Community Science, and I have the pleasure of facilitating our webinar today entitled Place-Based Models, What's Working to Build Black Wealth? This work comes as an extension of Community Science's Equitable Community Development Practice Area and a continuation of some of our previous webinars that went deeper into the, the measures and the aspects and the metrics we use about talking about the racial wealth divide. And I would encourage you all to take a look at Community Science's YouTube page to see our past webinars. There's some great resources there, and we can provide the link after today's webinar. I'm joined today by some esteemed, esteemed colleagues and experts in the field right now um, that we're going to be discussing in, at the panel discussion. Um, Kenyatta James from the Economy League of Greater Philadelphia, Nia Evans and Sierra Peters from the Ujima Project in Boston, and Dr. Alex Carmadell from the Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative. Um, I'm very thankful to have them all here today to talk about this great topic, and, and we'll be sort of doing our panel discussion with them in a bit here after I do a little bit of housekeeping and some level setting. So our agenda today, um, I'm going to provide you with some key takeaways that I hope you all can kind of walk away with at the end of this webinar, sort of, sort of my goals, my sort of pieces that I want you to walk away with. Um, like I said, I'll do some quick level setting around what is race explicit uh, economic development strategies and why we're talking about black wealth creation in particular, just to queue up our panel discussion. Um, and then we'll jump right into the panel where you'll learn from our experts and their, and their place-based models working to build black wealth in their respective areas. And then we'll have some time at the end for a QA. and a And I ask that during our session today, if you have any questions, please put them in the webinar Q&A um, where they will be collected by our administrator and used to inform the conversation you know, later today. So. so today's takeaways. What I'm hoping you walk away with today, one is just a basic understanding of, of place-based collective black wealth creation models and their importance, uh, the barriers that these models face and, and how we're trying to address or solve that, to learn from our experts today on how they're working to build black wealth in their respective communities with their programming and initiatives. And using an evaluation lens, I'm hoping we learn some lessons today about the effectiveness of these models. That is what's working, what might not be working, how can we improve, how can we think about incorporating other sort of some of these strategies or models in other places um, so that we can kind of build this work out more. Uh, the webinar today was organized by Community Science, and, and our emphasis for this webinar today is learning and evaluation. So Community Science is a research and evaluation organization that recognizes in order to be good researchers, good evaluators, and good community members, we need to constantly be open to active learning from expert sources. So not only learning from expert sources, but also kind of applying our evaluation lens so that you know what we learn, we can build and expand upon bringing out the successes, talking about the, the barriers and impediments so that we can kind of amplify this good work that's in line with our equity-centered mission. So let's dive right in. So what do we mean when we're talking about race-explicit strategies to economic development? And in particular, those working to build Black wealth or, or sort of Black-explicit strategies. And we're talking about strategies, initiatives, policies, or programs that center equity to address the needs or disparities faced by a specific race or ethnic group. That's not to say that they are race exclusive in their approach, right? We're not trying to do this only for the benefit of one particular group and not care about anything else. Rather, the understanding is that the current economic system has both disproportionate access and impact for certain groups. So the disproportionate access and access and impact for something like education, education, people kind of access education in this country very differently across racial and ethnic groups for a variety of reasons. And, and a legacy of past and present laws, policies, practices, and biases are informing how our present day resources are valued and distributed. So these race explicit or race informed strategies abandon sort of the colorblind assumption of, of equal access across all groups and, and really looks at a way of, of building tailored or nuanced approaches that work to combat the exact inequalities or barriers preventing certain racial or ethnic groups from freely accessing resources or assets. So the mindset is if you fix it for this one group or you tailor your approach 
to get better housing access for uh, this indigenous population that I'm working with, you're fixing it for later groups and other groups that are also experiencing that disparity or that sort of limited access in a different way. You're, you're helping, you're fixing it for all groups by focusing and tailoring your uh, strategy towards one. So then the question really becomes, you know, why black wealth? Why, why have be black explicit in your strategies or programming? And, and the answer is unfortunately simple. No other racial group in this country has consistently faced more barriers to collective wealth creation than black individuals. And I think that's evident in this timeline of this country's treatment of black individuals since you know, the first enslaved Africans landed here in 1619, were brought here in 1619. We're talking about 250 years of slavery, almost 90 years of segregation following that, and we're currently in a system that continues to devalue and extract upon black livelihoods and assets right now in this era of structural racism. But we consistently, the economic system consistently asks and expects black individuals to make the same amount of progress as white populations have in this country, you know, even though they've been extracted, <laughs> even though basically make the same progress that white populations have in the same, you know, in the short time period. And all, by the way, during that time period when white populations were extracting and benefiting from your forced labor. So it's basically like asking a group of, we're going to run a relay race, but you can't start until 300 years after I did and make sure that you have caught up to me at this point, basically. That's the analogy here. So that's sort of the emphasis on, on building Black wealth, building collective Black wealth. So when we talk about this, we're talking about confronting the structural determinants or barriers purposely or implicitly in place that prevent collective wealth creation among Black individuals. So when we're talking structural determinants, what are those factors that influence these social and economic outcomes, that influence how we value assets and resources for different groups? So when we think about drivers of wealth creation, we think about these sort of boxes of, of income, whether that's through you know, gaining your income through employment or through owning or operating a business, through housing, through health, uh, you know, to be healthy is to be wealthy, as the saying goes, and, and assets. So what have you saved or invested in, as well as anything that can be passed on to the next generation? And if we look at what are those structural determinants that, that kind of in, inhibit creation of collective Black wealth, we're talking about what are those factors that are in place that make it harder to gain sustainable family waging employment or to build your own business. And we're talking about a, a consistently defunded public education system. We're talking about the high cost of secondary education and professional credentialing. We're talking about the, the emphasis on minimum wage versus a, a living wage. We're talking about racial biases in, in hiring practices and wage negotiations, the cost of home ownership. And, and one thing I wanna emphasize in these is like too often we talk about these structural determinants as, oh, it's the past that's influencing how we act now. And yes, that is true, but it's also these sort of biases, prejudice, and, and inherent racism that is happening right now and manifests its way right now. It's not just the past, it's racism now, too. And I think, you know, if we think about sort of the biases and property appraisals, that's a perfect example of that's happening in 2023. That's happening in 2022. There's been plenty of research and studies out there where individuals at the same property will make the house look like it's white owned versus black owned. And each time the appraiser will come in and devalue the black owned property, even though there's not much difference in terms of the housing structure or what it is. Gentrification too, we're seeing predatory investors kind of come into areas, mostly black neighborhoods and brown neighborhoods that they believe are going to gentrify and will offer sort of opportunities to sell the home. We'll buy your homes, we'll buy your house, you know, and then are able to flip it and get a higher market value for it afterwards. So these, these structural determinants are, are, yes, a legacy of, of racism that is in our history, but they're also sort of the racism of today. Um, health, the general cost of health care, uh, uh, the fact that we have a predominance of employer-provided health insurance in this country and not necessarily a well-funded public health system. Uh, the legacy of dehumanization and medical experimentation in the African-American community by the medical researchers, Tuskegee, uh, uh, the Henrietta Lacks are just sort of two prime examples of that that cause, have caused sort of mistrust. Um, Over-policing and gun violence that has occurred, you know, disproportionately for Black communities in this country. Environmental pollution, 
Um, and then assets, sort of the predatory credit, you know, if you can't sort of get a financial, if financial institutions are biased towards you and providing you loans, credit card companies may prey on you or prey on low income populations. Um, access to legal counsel, this is something we've been dealing with with some of our work too, is just sort of the ability to write a will is expensive and being able to make sure that you can pass on your savings and investments to the next generation. Um, the impacts of mass incarceration and inhibited generational wealth. The other part of this too is like, yes, we kind of categorize these across these uh, uh, measures of the drivers of, of wealth collection, but these are not mutually exclusive. They feed into each other and one affects the other. So, you know, your racism in financial institutions or lack of access to capital is related to how you're building assets later. Um, so I just want to emphasize that. And we see this kind of play out in the data, uh, in, in the data that we know in our economic data. Black becomes the ultimate signifier of variation across economic metrics. When we look at sort of, uh, of labor force participation, employment, education, you know, Black is sort of devalued and dehumanized across our metrics here. It automatically signifies less than in this country. If I were to say Black schools, Black neighborhoods, there's a connotation there that our economic system places on that when it shouldn't. Um, building Black wealth is about dealing with our history. It's about working to address the systems in place that continue to extract upon and devalue anything Black. So that is why we uh, are talking with our experts today who are working on this, who are working to address this, who are working to build collective Black wealth. One thing I want to emphasize too is that you know, building collective Black wealth and being race explicit or being Black explicit in your approaches, that doesn't mean you have to build a whole program that is exactly Black explicit. You can do that. And we do have one of our <laughs> panelists today who does do that. Their work is that and, and do a great job of that. But you can build sort of these race explicit strategies within your existing programming as well, right? So you can have a program that is working to help minority owned businesses, and you recognize that there is a barrier that black business owners are facing in comparison with other groups, and you develop a strategy to address that in some way. And like you said, you're sort of building an opportunity basically to, to fix it for other groups coming forward by doing a nuanced black explicit strategy or approach in your programming. So let me introduce our panel and their organizations, and I can't wait to get into our discussion today. So first up from Philadelphia, we have Kenyatta James, the PAGE Director at the Economy League of Greater Philadelphia. PAGE stands for Philadelphia Anchors for Growth and Equity. It is an anchor collaborative in Philadelphia where more than a dozen regional hospitals and universities are working to localize and, and diversify their procurement supply chains. PAGE is also working with small and diverse business owners and entrepreneurs to help build their capacity to better compete for large procurement contracts and to work their way in industries that have historically barred their participation. Through a variety of strategies and initiatives, Kenyatta and his team have helped unlock over $37 million in contract revenue for local and minority owned firms in 2022 alone. Next, we have Nia Evans, the executive director of the Boston Ujima Project, as well as her colleague, Sierra Peters, who is the director of communication, culture, and enfranchisement. The Boston Ujima Project is a democratic member-run organization building cooperative economic infrastructure in Boston with the mission to return wealth to working class communities of color. The Ujima Project incorporates a variety of strategies as it builds resources for local communities of color, just check out their website. And one central component of that is the Ujima Fund, a democratic investment vehicle raising capital to finance small businesses, real estate and infrastructure projects in Boston for their working class BIPOC communities. And at its core, the Ujima Project is a model of deep democracy through community planning and non-extractive non financing. As of 2023, uh, the Ujima Project's commitment to fostering economic empowerment has propelled it to invest over $1 million with over $1.6 million deployed across eight businesses since its launch in 2018. Finally, we have Dr. Alex Carmadell from the Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative, or AWBI. AWBI is a dynamic regional nonprofit made up of a community of investors, advocates, and activists working to transform systems and structures of capital to create opportunities to build Black wealth in Atlanta and across the South. Since 2018, AWBI has provided over $2 million in grants, loans, and technical assistance to strengthen Atlanta's small and diverse business ecosystem. They are Black explicit in all of their approaches and strategies, and I'm very excited to have you all here today. So 
I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a little bit here so we can kind of jump into the conversation. And my first question is, we talked about sort of the structural determinants. We talked about sort of uh, being Black explicit, race explicit strategies. Kenyatta, I'm going to go to you. What do you see as the problem and how are you working to solve it? How do you define the problem and how are you working to solve it? I may have lost them for a minute. So, you know, Nia, I'm going to go to you. <laughs> Nia and Sierra, <laughs> what do you see as the problem and how are you trying to solve it? Sure. Um, thank you, Mike. So first, I appreciate your um, introduction. And I saw uh, one of the questions was, uh, are you going to share the presentation? And definitely would like a copy of the presentation myself. Course, um, so. Because I'm going to say, uh, for you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head uh, for us. Um, I know uh, in our formation, um, in terms of the reality that we wanted to address, um, and an, an enduring reality that we'd like to address is poverty uh, in our communities. Um, that said, um, I think we are we are under no um, illusions um, as to how um, our communities had our wealth stolen, um, and then uh, uh, you know s specific institutions, laws, practices, etc. Uh, played a role um, in uh, in creating enduring realities of of poverty. Um, and so, so when I say you you hit the nail on the head, um, what we've done is we've created an ecosystem approach. So really love the chart uh, where you you spell out uh, structural impediments and assets and income, um, et cetera, because we understand when we're talking about poverty, um, at the time that Ujima formed, uh, it was against the background of very intense uh, gentrification, uh, very intense displacement. Uh, the Federal Reserve of Boston had just put out a report uh, called The Color of Wealth uh, about the racial wealth gap. Uh, so that was a, a newer uh, uh, conversation um, that was that was entering the dialogue. And, and so then, uh, uh, there was also um, reaction to the very stunning report uh, that, that came out of Boston um, and then later other cities um, in the US as a whole. And so, uh, you know, when I say poverty, gentrification, displacement, uh, racial wealth gap, um, we understand, understood then and understand all of these as interconnected systems as you've, as you've already um, correctly identified. And uh, so for us, we said, realities that we understand as uh, interconnected. Um, you cannot attribute them to a singular cause, uh, which is what uh, organizations uh, in the past have attempted to do. And, and you, you, number one, you can't attribute it to a singular cause. Uh, number two, the direction, whatever the cause you're attributing it to is important. And again, historically, um, for example, uh, one reason that was given for our realities was our lack of financial literacy. Um, that's questionable. That's debatable in the first place. Um, and again, um, even if we threw everything we had at financial literacy, which we've seen some people try to do, um, again, because we are not talking about uh, realities that have a, that can be attributed to a singular cause, um, those efforts are going to fall way short. So our response, our redress has to be uh, appropriately uh, systematic um, or not systematic, I'm sorry, appropriately systemic um, and appropriately address um, how uh, the different institutions, policies, et cetera, um, how they are interconnected. And so we focus on an ecosystem approach. The second thing I'll say before I'll pause and, and hand the bike back, back to uh, Kenyatta, is um, for us, we are also thinking about power. Uh, so again, when I think about uh, your excellent uh, introduction, um, again, one of the things that we understand is our wealth has been stolen and as po power in this country uh, is a function of wealth, um, then there's, there's power that's been uh, stolen. Uh, from our communities as well, and as you've said, um, continues to be impeded. Um, so I, I actually really do appreciate 
opening with this question. It's not like we don't think about what the the problem is all the time, but I do want to say what what I am newly adding to this um, again when I think about racial wealth gap, poverty, gentrification, displacement. What I'm newly want to add to this is the thought that a problem, not the problem, but a problem um, has been, or is, I should say, um, the theft of our power to be active agents uh, in our communities. And so what I would say Ujima is doing, um, and you'll see this in our offering memorandum, we have a section that's called appreciating the true value of our community's assets. Um, black life in general in this country is devalued. And so that means um, our ideas are devalued. Uh, we as people are devalued. Um, what we create is devalued. Um, so then a problem then is that actual devaluation. And um, address then is to appropriately, properly value um, us and then everything that follows then I think we'll we'll show um we'll show that value. I appreciate that. Sierra, did you want to add anything to to what Nia said? Um I really appreciate uh everything Nia says. I think, you know, uh like, first of all, thank you for having us. I think secondly, um if you can permit me to add some levity, uh, you know, if Nia is Jay-Z and is you know rapping off of the dome i'm a very writerly person uh and so you will see me reading and i just want you all to know that that is definitely what's happening um i think you know nia you really hit the nail on the head and this is something that we discuss a lot um in our time together uh working together these past couple of years um i think you know uh as you stated earlier i'm a, i'm currently an mfa candidate um at an art school and I'm thinking really deeply and have been thinking really deeply as a result of my engagement with Ujima about uh, narrative and narrative building and the ways that power is usually exercised and conferred through stories of the wealthy and the powerful um, and the ways that, you know, what Nia is talking about, like this intentional deliberate assertion of power, you know, negotiating power, understanding our power, um, reclaiming power, um, understanding the difference between power and domination, how all those things feed into narrative building. Um, and feed into the work that we're doing, um, you know, to keep wealth in our spaces. I think that, you know, while I think that Ujima um, ultimately is trying to tell a new story about the way that power is created and shared through culture, participatory and economic democracy. Um, and in a lot of our communications work, you know, we're really uh, engaged in a deliberate kind of narrative shift around, as Nia said earlier, who and what is valued um, in our communities and money being part of that, but like, it's also not just money. It's also about affirming kind of, and I hate to get super woo woo here, but affirming our best, most natural ways of being. While Ujima is attempting to solve for our material needs, thinking about housing, food, health justice, et cetera, et cetera, queer and trans justices. Um, uh, I think that we're also just, um, another thing that Nia says a lot, uh, we're also thinking about all the other things that we need to thrive and uh, thinking about how we can repair our relations with one another. So when we are in spaces, we are able to value each other um, and you know engage in some uh, evaluation of formal and informal ways that our power is being negotiated. So really appreciate um, everything people just, that you just said, Nia, um, and I'll pass it to Kenyatta. What is the problem, right? What do we What's identify the as the problem? And how are you working to solve it? Oh, right now, Zoom. No, let me stop. <laughs> um, so one of the one of the weird things about being African American in this space, right, is that we have to compete in a mature economy and an econ an, in an economy that's been allowed to mature at times when we weren't allowed to participate, right? Um, so when you look at the United States, it's not like a developing country where you just need people that can build roads. You just need people that can set up infrastructure. You just need people that can cook food and uh, take land and make productive uses out of it or whatever. Like everything valuable in this country are most things that are considered valuable in this country are kind of owned by someone, right? Like, so you have to pay a premium to get into every industry, to compete for every opportunity. Which means that if there's not space given to you, everyone can move forward as though you don't exist. 
And I think that for the group that we work with, which are minority businesses that are B2B, that are looking to work with institutions, that's the situation that they find themselves in a lot, right? They provide needed services. There's a market for their services, but there's also others that provide those services. And many times the others that provide those services are older because they were allowed to start in the 50s and 60s and 40s when we were not. Um, so we end up in this super competitive market where minority businesses are trying to muscle their way in against normally larger and more established competitors. Um, and that doesn't mean that these competitors are better, right? Like I think that there is a lot that our businesses have to offer that the larger competitors can't. You know what I mean, we have hospitals and colleges buying books from Amazon and they can't get returns. They can't make adjustments and they're frustrated and they would love to work with local businesses. And we've been able to help them facilitate that because they wanted that customer service element. So there's always that opportunity. Um, but I also think that the one of the major problems that we face is that Black Americans, let me get this light, but we do live- I was going to say, you said too yeah, many wrong things, they're, they're coming for you. <laughs> All of the things, right? Black people in the dark. But, um, <laughs> yeah, one of the things that we all have to deal with is the fact that we are in a mature economy and it's hard to compete when there's already a bunch of businesses that do what you do. Right, right. And I think to like emphasize your point too, is like those older companies that were allowed to compete help establish and sort of build the infrastructure around themselves, basically. We, in those positions of power, like me and Sierra were saying, they got the say in how to move forward in their industries or how to move forward with their B2B relations that they made the rules, basically. And now not only are you entering a system that kind of, you know, you weren't, you were excluded from, but the rules weren't made with for you at all either, so. And this isn't, I, I you know, I, I think you mentioned this, I think uh, Nia nee mentioned this a little bit, but this isn't like some far off academic issue, right? It's not, oh, a long time ago, they made the rules and now we have to reverse it. Like today, large players write the RFPs for contracts that come out of institutions and government, right? How are you supposed to compete with the organization that wrote the contract that they are then going to bid on? That makes it a really difficult ecosystem. Right now, these organizations have people that used to work at their organization that now work at the institution that makes the hiring decision for the organization. These are not like academic far out issues. Minority businesses are rarely at the scale to have that revolving door effect. Whereas a, you know, a top um, accounting firm, for example, the controller, the in-house accountant at that institution likely worked at a top firm before getting that job, which means that they know people at that firm, which means when it, it comes time for that contract to come up, it's, hey, my buddy George that I used to work with for 12 years or this random minority business that I don't have any relationship with. And it's hard to break people out of those habits. And this is not, like I said, it's not some academic practice it's it's very direct in the way it works in our markets alex i kick it over to you how are you defining how is your organization defining the problem and what are you doing to solve yeah well th thank you for having me um and i'm listening to my my colleagues and peers on this call and we have uh we're all in different places but we share some of the same uh, definitions in terms of what the problem is, and we're certainly uh, tackling it from a very similar angle. Um, I will I will start, I think, by putting a bit of a twist on this. So, and and it, you know, if you uh, indulge me, it kind of gets to the why of what we do and and why we're so uh, firm about our position on focusing on collective black wealth, not just individual black wealth. So. Um, Recently, I posted on LinkedIn a very controversial news article about Tyler Perry. Um, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, uh, commonly understood as the Black Mecca, uh, the seat of Black middle class achievement. And a lot of that reputation is drawn from the success of individuals like Mr. Perry and others. And 
I live on the south side, just maybe five minutes away from the uh, movie studio, which is massive and um, takes up a lot of land, um, not too far from the airport. And the story was about the fact that despite uh, Perry's ascendance into becoming a billionaire and owning such a large plot of land, which he acquired through uh, city transactions at a steal, I mean, pennies on the dollar, uh, relatively, um, you don't see the community benefit. Um, in fact, the article revealed that despite having received significant uh, credit, tax credits and other incentives, um, he's been able to avoid property taxes, which if folks understand, you know, um, how our schools and communities and broader infrastructure are funded, it's through general revenue funds that are supported by our tax code. And so having a studio situated in a community that is majority black, um, uh, with schools that I'm sure if he wouldn't send his own kids to, uh, it would, you know, make sense to folks that we might want to, you know, critique or at least scrutinize um, the existence of the studio and that, that form of wealth. Um, so anyway, a lot of backlash from that post. And my only uh, contribution in the, in the comment was that individual wealth is not synonymous with community wealth. And this is a great example of, of just that. Um, now, of course, the response is, well, he's creating jobs. Well, there was a giant uh, film tax credit audit that came out a few years ago, finding that most of the jobs generated from that credit do not go to local residents. Um, the wages are abysmal and so much more. So it's just not enough to say that one's, uh, you know, uh, philanthropy is enough to build wealth. And um, this is one example of a repeat story that is the backdrop of Atlanta, Georgia, the city of Atlanta. Um, this is one story about how economic development has happened decade after decade in this city. Um, and a result of this, this um, approach to economic development has led to Atlanta being the number one place for income inequality in the nation for decades. Um, a place where the median wealth of white households is 46 times more than it is for black households and uh, so much more, right? Um, in fact, Atlanta was a majority black city just five years ago. It's no longer a majority black city, um, which you know means we might need to change our uh, title as the black Mecca. And so I raise all this to say that this is why AWBI exists. You know, we were kind of called into this work maybe five or six years ago um, to address uh, the lack of attention given to actual wealth disparities. There's lots of work to do in terms of filling income gaps, right? Like we institute a lot of job training programs and there's tons of anti-poverty work in the community, but very few efforts are actually focusing on building wealth. And our original approach to this was through entrepreneurship because Atlanta's legacy um, has been through uh, building black wealth through small business ownership and through entrepreneurship, primarily into uh, the great work of Kenyatta and his colleagues through procurement and through contracting um, under former mayor, uh, uh, Maynard Jackson and his work with the Atlanta airport, which is the busiest airport in the world. So um, given that legacy, we leaned into that as a way to help address racial wealth disparities. But um, you then, you know, start to realize that if you focus on that, you're only touching probably about 3% of businesses <laughs> that are Black owned in this city. Um, the vast majority of businesses that are exist in this place are solopreneurs, which means that they're not operating a firm to build wealth per se. <laughs> they're operating their firm as a survival tactic to, mm -hmm. you know, keep a roof over their heads and so much more. And so once we understood that, you know, maybe entrepreneurship isn't the sole uh, focus for us to as a wealth building strategy, what are some ways we can tackle kind of broader um, the structural determinants that you laid out um, earlier today, Mike? So that is the work of AWBI today. Um, and our main, we have a practice and programmatic arm of our organization that does things like provide flexible loan capital to, to business owners. Um, we are working with the broader capital ecosystem to figure out how to 
coordinate financial institutions in a way so that they can uh, adhere to their Community Reinvestment Act goals and, you know, drive capital into communities where they have historically redlined those communities. Um, and some of the research that we've been able to produce over the last several months have shown that banks consistently continue to redline communities as far as home loans are concerned and as far as bank loans are concerned or business loans, excuse me, um, and so much more. So we are, you know, flexing kind of our research and policy muscle now to help change the narrative around wealth building so that we don't focus solutions exclusively on direct service, on job training programs and more, but instead on actually rewriting the, the codes, rewriting the statutes so that Black folks are, are seen in these, in these policy debates. Um, in terms of the place-based piece, you know, we are um, birthed out of Atlanta and we continue to work um, in Atlanta, it's, it's kind of our home here, but we're also uh, uh, partnering and collaborating with entities, municipalities, and other organizations across the South, because we recognize that the Southeast is a, um, uh, it's a bastion of, you know, of Black folks, right? Like it's where the m m most of us live. And um, we drive resources into communities um, through grant capital and through other forms of capital to help bolster the capacity of other organizations in those Southern places to, to do great work too. Um, we do a lot more place-based work. I'll, I'll save maybe some of those examples for other questions or comments, but that's that's our problem and that's why we're, we're here. Thanks, thank you all. Um, so we're kind of framing the problem here, but I wanna start asking sort of, what are your ingredients of success? What, what were the key elements of your initiative that you couldn't do your work without basically at the end of the day. Let's think about that. Um, and and Nia, I'm gonna kind of throw it back to you since you started our conversation before. What what are the key elements to the Ujima Project's success? Sure, thank you. Um, so number one, I would say is relationships. Um, and I think um, that, well, there's a way in which Keanu talked about this. Um, I think there is a writ large and underappreciation of how much is driven um, by relationships. Um, when we talk about kind of how you create a, something like a Ujima in the place where you are, I think one of the things we're always very careful to say is I mean, I, I think eventually, you know, if you keep at it, you'll find some, some success. But I've, I've definitely been in some places where um, people look at the model. Uh, we're a multi-stakeholder, so we're multi-racial, multi-class, multi-stakeholder. That's the other piece that I'll say um, is, as an aside, we're bringing, but a, an important aside, we're bringing a lot of expertise to the table. That's the multi-stakeholder piece. Um, and then when I combine the multi-stakeholder piece with the relationship piece, what that has looked like is we have uh, people from organizing, we have people from finance, we have uh, people, uh, regular community members, we have small business owners um, who came together in the creation of Ujima. And so that means whatever our prior experience, our prior background, uh, the relationships that we have already formed, we're bringing that to the creation of Ujima. Whereas what I, and this is what I was starting to say earlier, I have been in some places where people have looked at that and said, okay, they've got impact investors, they've got small business owners, they have organizers. Um, okay, let's go out and find these people. <laughs> in this place and then let's say let's do a thing together but you're missing the prior relationship piece mm -hmm. um and so i was actually in a place where after kind of doing a workshop and having a conversation it was really notable because very particularly black community members in that place then came up to me afterwards and said we've never talked to these people before ever We've never been in a room with these people. And it was not for lack of trying. And so again, we go back to how are Black people truly regarded and valued? Mm. Uh, so community members who were coming up to me afterwards and saying, 
never had a conversation with them, have been excluded from conversations, have been dismissed. What's also notable is they were not the ones that brought us there. It was white power brokers in those communities that brought us there. And so again, those same <laughs> uh, people who had been dismissive mm. were now willing to act transactionally and use people to get a thing done. Um, so I think it's going to be tough going. Um, if you see Ujima, if you see Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative, if you see other peers and partners and say, their work, their work looks cool. Let me start a thing like that here. Um, but because I actually don't truly value different expertise and I don't truly value different community members, I've not put any time, type of time in. I've not built any type of relationships. Um, I've not been in solidarity. I've not worked with anyone. And so I think that that's been key uh, to Eugene's success is we were not a group of people who just came out of nowhere. Mm. Um, again, there, there were about 40 of us that came together to start Eugene. We were coming from different places. We had already built trust. And what I want to emphasize there is we did not build trust transactionally. So even as I'm saying this today, I can also imagine someone saying, okay, let me now put together my three-year plan where the first year will be trust building. Mm. Um, that was not how we operated. Um, I'm black. I'm a black queer woman. Um, I am not scared of black people. I am not scared of women. I'm not scared of queer people. So what that means is in my everyday existence, I love black people, I love women, I love queer people. That means in my every movement that shows. And so then that means that I am interacting with fellow community members in a certain way um, that shows that I, I value us all equally. And so then when the time comes, and one of the things that, I think this is another reason for our success, success when the time comes and I'm able to, uh, say to community members, before Eugene, I was with the Boston branch and the NAACP, and I'm able to say, so in conversations in our communities, I've heard people say, I have a bunch of ideas. The problem is as an individual, I don't have the resources to carry it out. Mm. What I would love to be able to do is I would love to be able to get together with family members, with friends, with community members. I'd love for us to be able to pull our resources together. And I'd love for us to be able to, to actually do ourselves what we want to do. We have dreams. We have ideas. We don't have the individual resources and power to do so. So again, appreciating Alex taking the time to focus on collective wealth and collective power. Because then when we came together to form Ujima, I was then able to say to NAACP members and to fellow community members, yesterday, you said you would love to be able to do this. Guess what? Today, you can do it. Mm. It's not a dream. It's not far-fetched. It's not one day. It's not so aspirational that it, it seems impossible. It's actually possible. And, and we're creating... Um, the skeleton, but we're creating a skeleton such that you can get in on the ground floor again. So we're not a group of people that came out of nowhere with, with some great, wonderful, fully baked idea. And we're just asking you to buy in and we're hoping you're, you're happy that we're here, but we're able to present uh, uh, a bit of uh, enough, enough to have something that is not completely blank slate to say, what do you think? And we invite you in to create this with us and to shape it with us. Um, so relationships, uh, multi-stakeholder, bringing, bringing various expertise uh, to bear. And then, and and the, I mean, there's more, but in terms of what I've, what I've just said to summarize, and actually um, being responsive to what communities have said uh, that we want um, and being responsive uh, to, our, to our expertise. So there really is like a power in in not only the the relationships but like building authenticity in those relationships as well and and I really like that like too often it's transactional and too often is that we had a question um, come up 
that uh, in sort of asking you directly, Nia, like how important are those white power brokers in, in your conversations of, of building black wealth or building power in Boston? You know, can we create black wealth without white power brokers in the current system? Sure. And I wonder if this is the, there are a couple of anonymous attendees. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if this is the same anonymous attendee. Um, so I think there are two ways that I'll answer this this question because th there was a thing that you added at the end of, of that question, Mike, and you said in this current system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that I appreciate that I think both Kenyatta, um, well, actually you, Mike and Kenyatta, and I think I heard this in Alex's remarks as well. Um, I think there are a couple of things that always have to be happening at the same time. And I think it's something that Ujima does. Um, I think we have to be creating the world that we want. And we also have to uh, contend with the world as it is. So I don't, I don't think we, I don't, I think to choose one or the other um, is a mistake and it's, and it's misguided. I think to reside in one or the other is, is misguided. So um, in the, in the world as it is, let me look at this question again. I don't think I'm going to say, so how important are white power brokers? I think in the world, in the world as it is, um, white power brokers can be important. Um, I think I would stop short of saying they are a necessity, but I think they can be important. Um, I don't think white power brokers um, have to be ruled out uh, or dismissed. Um, the way that this looks at Ujima, for example, is we have um, two broad tiers of membership this is just one of the ways it looks. We have a voting membership. We have a solidarity membership. Voting membership is for people who are resident of Boston proper. And we say, we really want to center working class BIPOC people. So if you don't identify as working class or if you don't identify as BIPOC, we ask you to consider taking out a solidarity membership. So voting members vote directly on what it is we invest in. Our thesis is you should have that decision-making power by virtue of your residence. So we have some black people, for example, who don't identify as working class who will take out a solidarity membership. And then we have some people who don't identify as BIPOC, even if they live in Boston, who will take out a solidarity membership. And the solidarity membership in any organization is support of that organization, it's support of that community. So then there we can see how, for example, a white power broker can interact with Ujima by virtue of membership, support the organization, support the community, support the ecosystem, support the work um, that we're doing. That's one example. Another example is our investors. We've we've decoupled investment from decision making. Um, that's not always that's not always clear, but the decision making in Ujima is by our voting members, as I said. Mm -hmm. Another opportunity we provide is investment in the Ujima Fund, um, and again. Uh, investors in the Ujima Fund, um, you know, cross the gamut uh, in terms of demographics. Uh, so white power brokers um, can invest uh, in the fund. It's not solely white power brokers. We work to make it accessible to working class BIPOC uh, people in Boston and in Massachusetts. But again, um, this is where uh, people can be uh, supportive. Um, and that's that's in the that's in the world uh, as it is. I think Ujima, what we try to do is we really try to give people both permission and practice to say we can create a different world. Um, you might talk about rules. I think Alex and Kiata, I heard you talk about rules and codes and policies as well. Um, and this, th I think for me, this kind of answers the other anonymous attendees question in terms of power in black communities. Um, I would say the heart of our work, and I believe Sierra has also addressed this in terms of talking about narrative, the heart of our work is saying we can actually change things, really. We can actually decide this system is bogus. We can actually decide 
these rules are bogus. We can actually decide these policies are bogus. And then we can decide what we do in the wake of that. We can try to change them formally. That's a strategy. Um, we could just not do them. <laughs> That's another strategy. We can also just do what we want to do. That's another strategy. And then we can also just create new rules. That's another strategy. Um, I think Ujima, we we try to give people practice at a, a multi-pronged strategy. So again, not one or the other. Um, but for me, in terms of optimizing uh, our success to the to the extent that we can do multiple things, uh, we will. But that that I think is what we really try to do with our fund, with our democratic processes, with our membership body, with uh, our community, is to say we can act. And here's and that's what I mean by powers: is the ability to act, to be agents um, uh, in our in our own in our own communities, and to not be bound by tradition and to not be bound by rules um, and to and to determine our own value and to not be bound by traditional value. And yet I wanna throw it over to you real quick because both the question of, of what has been your pages sort of elements of success, what are the key ingredients of, of your success that you would identify, but also the space that you're in, you are dealing with a lot of white power brokers um, on, on, on the regular. So, so how you navigate that too? Yeah, I mean, I think Alex is probably in a similar situation to me where you're in a city where Black people have political power, but not really economic power. Um, so you're in this really weird um, situation where in some ways the community has power. In some ways the community definitely does not have power. And in some ways there's a mix. So I think that we we find ourselves working with a lot of white power brokers, of course, um, leaders of institutions, uh, people uh, that are leaders of just different forms of economic leverage. And one of the things that we try to do is hold people accountable to the things that they say, right? Because nobody, I mean, I shouldn't say nobody because there are people out there. But most people that are leaders of organizations are not coming out and saying like, hey, we don't want to give black people jobs or we don't want to give black people opportunities. Right. Um, and then like after George Floyd, you had a lot of people coming out and saying, like, we want to create more opportunities, more opportunities. We got to fix this. We need to do this and do that. But the operationalization of that is necessarily difficult. Right. Like it's not just like you flip a switch and it's like, oh, great. Now everything's fixed. Right. You don't spend hundreds of years disenfranchising a group, like very targeted and specifically, and then suddenly say, oh, I'm done with that. And then it all goes away. Mm -hmm. Like you have to start to undo things. And I think that that is where we've been successful is because we are very focused, right? We, we take a look at a process that businesses go through. We look at it by industry, we look at it by size, we look at it by type of institution, we find where those barriers are and then we try to fix those barriers in the moment so that people have a real chance. Uh, so some of that is on the institution side, looking at them and saying, hey, why do you require this? And is that necessary? Why are you requiring that architectures have the same sort of insurance as people that are actually working on your construction site? That just seems like a way to make sure that only big architecture firms have contracts, right? Um, so we do things like that to try to make sure that, that opportunities are open. We work with people on their um, payment terms, make sure that those payment terms are as fast as possible so that small businesses can can get that uh, that money so that they're not being killed on cash flow. Mm -hmm. And then we also do things on the businesses side. We might give them coaching, we might give them training. Uh, we created a grant program we called the Hurdle Fund to pay for some of those costs that institutions put up. Uh, some of which might be necessary, uh, something like we can only take deliveries from a certain size of truck because that's all we have at this institution. Well, now you have to buy a certain size of truck. That might be expensive. Uh, so we are able to give up to $25,000 to minority businesses in the region to cover that third party cost to help them actually do the work with the institution. Um, and I think uh, Alex mentioned this, but 
we do only work with a certain segment of the business community, right? Mm -hmm. So we see ourselves as part of a wider strategy. Uh, there's others in the region that are better at other things than us. We do not want to step into their space. We do not want to step onto their toes. Our goal is to be the best we can be for this subset of the business community and allow others to be the best they can be for this subset of the business community, of the workforce development community, or whatever it is. Uh, because if Philadelphia has one thing, it is enough nonprofits. So we are able to kind of spread that burden around, which I think makes us that much more focused and effective. We are really trying to be like a best in class of one specific community and one specific set of problems. And I think that that's what's allowed us to be relatively successful in what we're doing. Alex, key ingredients of AWI success. What makes it possible? So, so partnership and collaboration. Um, the reality is that we are small but mighty. Um, and we intend to stay that way. Something that my CEO emphasizes, uh, Dr. Janelle Williams, often is that uh, we do not want to be an institution. Um, in fact, you know, this, I don't think any of us are in this work um, to, to, uh, uh, to not be out of business one day, right? Like we're all hopefully working to put ourselves out of these, these um, roles, or at least in dealing with these same issues. Um, and if it happens in our lifetime, great. I don't think the data would <laughs> tell us that that's possible, but um, we're at least kind of making minimal strides towards that. So in order for us to be effective, to make those strides, we have to collaborate with other organizations, other entities in meaningful ways. Um, I'll give you one example of how we scale through partnerships. Um, we, uh, whenever we were birthed uh, a few, several years ago, it was on the heels of a campaign that was ignited by a community of practice here in Atlanta. And the campaign was called the Thousand Black Businesses Campaign. And the goal of the campaign was to help a thousand black businesses um, hire one employee. Um, and so that way they would, you know, in our view, the ability of a black owned business to hire from their community is a community wealth building strategy, given that employment is one of the primary forms of, of money um, that black folks receive. But black owned businesses are more likely to hire from within their community mm -hmm. um, as well. So during that, uh, we realized, you know, to reach a thousand black owned businesses, we cannot like direct service our way into achieving that goal. Um, so we had to partner with business serving organizations and build their capacity, which is something we are better at in terms than in, when compared to direct service to serve more black owned businesses because they have a client base that they certainly wanna help get into more procurement opportunities or to access more capital, but they may not have the tools, the language, the policy expertise, et cetera to shape their programming so that they can um, better serve Black folks and Black business owners. So that's an example. So we, we've gone the RFP route, but we've shifted from RFPs to partnership agreements because we recognize that, you know, an RFP reinforces kind of a patriarchal or um, uh, paternalistic uh, framing in terms of partnership, uh, whereas now partnership agreements actually require us to put skin in the game as well not just money, um, but also like true collaboration, showing up to meetings, um, being in community, establishing data sharing agreements and things like that. And then also developing shared results or, or uh, shared outcomes as a result of, uh, of, the, of that partnership. So I would say, you know, that's, that's like the main kind of ingredient. I would say the other ingredient is that like, we're, we're intentionally situated in community like we, you know, uh, before this year, there was no research and policy arm of Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative. I came here to stand that up. And my philosophy has been that, you know, you can't be, um, you can't develop solutions unless you're approximate to the issue. So we um, spend a lot of time convening local residents, local business owners and others on um, what they would like to see happen or change within their community to advance some uh, their own priorities and established resident-led research and policy agendas. 
And, you know, what we find in those processes um, is a lot, you know, a lot of really um, alarming things happening within community that you don't see in the headlines, right? Um, one example is um, we have been, as a result of that process, developing um, emergent work around commercial affordability. Um, and the reason why we're leaning into commercial affordability is because we've sat with business owners who have exclaimed that they cannot afford to do business in a brick and mortar mm -hmm. in the city anymore. Um, in the last month, two of my favorite black owned businesses, one led by a black queer person, the other one led by a black and Hispanic woman in both the east side and the west side of the city, closed their doors because of rental hikes. Um, two of my places that I go, like earned my PhD in this coffee shop and now it's no longer in existence. Um, and it's because in, in one case, uh, a white woman relocated to a neighborhood and decided out of you know sheer charity in her heart that she would buy property in the neighborhood and begin to rent it back to, um, to black owned businesses. Well, that sounds great on its face, but not all that great whenever she buys that property just to hike the rents on the existing tenants in those properties, right? And so um, this, is, this has gotten our attention and it's something that we wouldn't know, like that nuance, that story, like the census doesn't tell us that, the existing data, it just doesn't, it doesn't give us that. Mm -hmm. If we're not talking to these business owners and going door to door and like sp spending time with these folks. So, um, so yeah, so I say all that to say we're, you know, as a result of that strategy, thinking about our commercial affordability work, how do we um, uh, fight against displacement of black owned businesses, primarily in historically black commercial corridors, um, Obviously, the uh, investment and policy attention in commercial displacement is a fraction of what folks are doing in the housing space, right? So there are lots of tools in the toolkit to preserve affordability in housing, to create affordable housing, and even those are insufficient, right? Um, uh, when you think about the scale of the problem. But when you look at commercial affordability, there's close to nothing from our analysis of what's available um, in Atlanta. There's like facade improvement programs. There are one-time grant programs that philanthropists give to the city and say, re-grant in the form of a program and make people compete uh, for these resources. There's no sustained revenue source to support commercial, uh, affordable commercial development. And it's certainly not race explicit where, when it does exist. Um, and so this is helping us develop an entire line of work around fighting displacement. And we're doing it in, in partnership with other organizations, national and locally, uh, uh, who have great expertise in this area too. So um, just wanted to highlight kind of what, <laughs> the, the, uh, what that ingredient has led to. Um, I will say one last thing on this and is that we, uh, also this year launched the Black Community Wealth Network, um, which is a network of stakeholders uh, representing all the different prongs of those structural determinants of collective Black wealth that you described earlier, from environment or climate, um, access to capital, all the way down to like folks working in the voter rights and democracy space, because, you know, we are in Georgia and there is a persistent assault on our ability, ability to vote. Um, but you kind of need folks in office that represent the ideals and um, priorities of Black folks. In um, uh, So it, it's important that we view access to the ballot box as an actual wealth building strategy. And so folks that um, uh, work in that space are also involved. So it's a very holistic approach um, to address some of those determinants. And that's an essential part of the, the um the recipe as well um, to, to building wealth in our city and beyond, so. Yeah. Um, so I wanna make sure that we do have enough time for the Q&A, so I'm gonna kind of end my portion here with, with one sort of dual question. Um, what would you say your organization's or initiatives, what would you say has been the greatest success? And what do you say is the biggest challenge that you're still dealing with? So Sierra, I'm actually going to throw it to you because I want to hear from you on the Ujima Project. What do you label as the Ujima Project's biggest success? And what do you think is the biggest challenge you face? Um, 
Yeah, uh, thank you, first of all, for asking this question. Uh, you know, immediately, uh, I think the biggest success, uh, you know, I'll start from before. So I joined Ujima as a member uh, in like 2017, uh, when, you know, Ujima was officially ratified and launched uh, as an organization. I think, yeah, 2017 uh, in the fall, I think it was like September or October, cannot exactly remember. Um, but, you know, I was one of the members that was like, yes, Ujima should exist. Um, and I think one of the uh, ways that I came to Ujima was understanding it as an urban planning project or a community planning project that, you know, folks were getting together to decide um, what kinds of businesses they wanted in their communities, what needs they thought that they that their communities, uh, um, what needs uh, uh, they had for their communities. So, for example, um, you know, one of the community needs was like more land trusts, uh, community owned energy, affordable child care, you know, event space, community owned Internet, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, in addition to that, we've gathered over 200 businesses um, that folks wanted us to invest in. Um, I think that, again, you know, what Nia talked about in the earlier stages about um, valuing different kinds of expertise, understanding that folks who have lived in these communities, um, myself included, I grew up in Dorchester uh, in Boston, um, you know, understanding that the folks who have lived here, uh, you know, are the folks who should be making decisions on uh, what businesses and infrastructure um, we invest in uh, was something that I you know, glommed onto immediately and loved um, and, you know, was really excited about in the early stages. Um, and so I think just all of the information uh, and carefully, you know, uh, uh, hard won <laughs> information that we've gathered um, from folks about what businesses they wanted us to support, what businesses they wanted us to invest in, the kinds of resources that they thought that we needed, the kinds of infrastructure that they that they thought that we needed. Um, you know, the ways that they even want us to organize and to move. Um, all of that has really come from community uh, 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 communities in Boston. Um, and so I think for me, one of the greatest achievements, um, you know, especially in my role, uh, you know, supporting the voting and enfranchisement efforts, um, you know, so gathering over 150 people to vote, you know, uh, on every ballot and on every investment ballot, it's not easy. Uh, it's hard one every single time, you know, Nia and I are, uh, as well as all of our team members are, you know, uh, alongside our solidarity members and other voting members are making calls like, hey, are you going to vote today? Uh, you know, um, so it's it's definitely hard one, but it is, um, you know, probably one of uh, the single best things to me um, are, are those interactions and, and being able to uh, concretely say this exists because you wanted it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. This exists because, you know, and again, as Nia talked about earlier, designing the city that we want, designing the city that we need, designing the economy that we want is just has always been really close to my heart. Um, and so I'm so jazzed about that. I think the hardest part for me, um, from my perspective, from a communications culture and enfranchisement, um, geez, it's all hard. I don't <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> You know, it's not easy work. Um, but I think the the greatest challenge um is I think the perspective shift. Um, and you know, I don't I don't say this lightly, right? Like I know that it's very lofty to say, like, you know, like emotions, you know, we should all value each other. It's very, you know, it's easy to say those things, but I do think that the perspective shift of moving from you know, especially me, you know, I don't know much about solidarity economy or like, I don't know if I should vote on this because I don't know if I have, you know, the knowledge and expertise to like say, like which community owned internet provider we should be investing in because I don't know anything about how the internet works. I just know that there's wires and they go into my house, you know, and it fuels uh, me to be able to talk to you today. Um, but doing the uh, community, uh, I'm sorry, doing the financial and political education work that we do every Wednesday mm -hmm. at Ujima Wednesdays, um, moving from that uh, intentional uh, knowledge production and information sharing by experts in their fields uh, to then move people into, okay, this is what you said that you wanted. Now you know how it works. Now we're going to vote on it. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, probably the greatest challenge, but uh, again, extremely rewarding um, and extremely hard one. Nia, biggest success of Ujima and the biggest challenge. Um, so I think I'm definitely going to echo uh, some of what Sierra has said. So um, I think definitely for me, so 
the thing that's central to Ujima, and I would say for the team, is our membership body. Um, and, and so then within that, what is central uh, is voting. And so I think our, our biggest success um, is that we have reached quorum on every single investment vote. Um, so to date, we have had eight investment votes. Our quorum right now is 50% plus one mm -hmm. um, because we wanted to say, if we are saying we want to be responsive to what community members say they want, we think we should be able to say at least a majority have voted for this for us to say it's actually representative. Mm -hmm. When we were doing our offering memorandum, and we and this is included as a risk in our offering memorandum. So demo true real democracy is risky. Let's just take that in. Um, so uh, when we were doing our offering memorandum, our attorneys who were great, um, we love them. They We get pro bono uh, legal uh, services, excellent top-notch firm. Um, so definitely want to make sure I, sh I show appropriate gratitude for them. Um, but they said 50% plus one. Are you, are you sure? Because the thinking was that's never going to happen. So then you're never going to make an investment because you're not going to get over half of your membership body to participate. And I said, what about something more like 20%? <laughs> and so we stuck to our guns and we said, no, 50% plus one, it has to be at least a majority. Um, and we have so far uh, kind of peaked. Uh, this was with uh, not the most recent vote we had, but the one uh, before that, which was in, uh, the most recent vote we had was August. The one before that was like May, something like that, at 59%. So we've we've met quorum and we've passed quorum. And uh, so now one of the things we wanna do with that um, is next year, we're going to be letting our members know we're raising the threshold for our quorum and we're gonna raise it to 60% externally. So we're gonna push, I mean, we're, we're essentially there. there. There's a way in which we're kind of cheating, I guess. I mean, we're essentially there, but we but we're we're gonna essentially hold ourselves to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we do want to eventually arrive at a point where we are where we can say a supermajority has participated. So we want to eventually be able to push it up to 75%. Um, so I said we've so that's been excellent. As I said, Sierra just talked about that a little bit. So that lets us know one thing people want to make these decisions. So we've started off with, um, and we've all said this in one way or another, people who are impacted uh, by certain realities uh, should, have, uh, should have a say. Um, we should be hearing from them. Uh, uh, voices, experience, expertise should be integral um, in whatever the address is. And we've talked about multiple addresses here today. Um, so this is, more than a theory, this is more than just what we think. This is this is more than a thesis. We're able to show people actually do want this power, um, and if given uh, and if and if given the opportunities, will take this power. Um, now that's with investment decisions. That's so that's kind of easy on a certain level. Um, and we we do a lot. I think we do great comms. Sierra's title is Director of Communications, Cultural and Enfranchisement. I think our communications is top notch. So we put together excellent credit memos, equity memos. They're beautiful. Um, they're very accessible. Um, our members can uh, essentially conduct due diligence on businesses. They understand debt deals. They understand equity deals. Um, so we're not here, for example, to say, uh, working class people, people of color, don't have certain technical abilities, don't understand certain things. That's not true. Um, so there's a way in which, yeah, that's kind of easy. I get to kind of say yay or nay to give this business some money. The challenge has been in other decision-making. So we've uh, had votes about our board, for example, what should our board look like? So some governance decisions. Uh, Sierra's talked about this a little bit. When we were fundraising for the fund, we said, hey, we have all this money. Um, and we had some people who were asking, where are you going to put it? Bank of America? 
Um, and so we thought, well, people are asking about this question enough that people want to make sure it goes into a, an institution that's not treating our communities uh, badly. So we asked, hey, where should we put undeployed fund money? And we got some people coming back saying, I don't, I don't know that I should answer that. So there's a challenge now for us, I would say, a big challenge with decision making that's kind of outside the investment arena. Um, so I think for us, we have to think about um, how we talk about how important that decision making is uh, as well. So we have had a couple of governance, for example, decisions where we've not met uh, quorum. Um, I'll pause there. That's helpful. Alex, AWI's biggest success in your opinion and, and the biggest challenge you face? Yeah, I think um, I'm a little bit, and I'm I'm getting coaching on this, but I'm a lot more modest in that I don't talk, I don't, I have a hard time naming the biggest successes, um, mm. but I will say um, we are, we are at an inflection point as a result of our research this year, which I think has helped shift the conversation about wealth in Atlanta in a significant way. So, um, so for instance, um, you know, we published this 60 page report called building a beloved economy, a baseline framework for building black wealth in Atlanta. And, um, prior to this, uh, you know, we wouldn't wouldn't be able to tell you what the median household net worth of Black households is compared to other race and ethnic groups at the city level. Um, now that we have that, and now that we done put it out in the world for everybody to see, um, a lot of people are uh, disturbed, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, a lot of people are thinking, well, how could that be? You know, we're you know, black folks are doing so well. We have Tyler Perry's and we have Cardi B's and TI's, like all of that. <laughs> and while all that's great, you know, I just remind folks again that collective wealth and individual wealth are just not synonymous. And I think this is a great, this is the result of us thinking that um, individual wealth will, will save us. So, um, so, you know, now we're having, we're educating community, we're in community, talking to folks, we're talking to policymakers, city council folk about what they can do about this. And now it's just opened up an entire new um, lane of, of, uh, of uh, conversation regarding solutions that can't focus on, you know, job training, for instance, like, you know, now folks are starting to see, oh, income and wealth are not the same thing. Those are two different um, measurements, right? Like, yeah, welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, now, now let's, let's get to work. Um, so I think that has been a big success um, for us this year. Um, I think you described, you asked also about pain points. Yeah, or, the or biggest challenge. challenge you're facing, or, or you can, as a pain point, sure. Yeah, so um, I think all of us share kind of a very race explicit approach to our work. And unfortunately, this has become um, highly scrutinized. It's always been scrutinized, right? Like for decades, for since, I mean, since our existence on this continent, um, it's been uh, uh, scrutinized, but um, the uh, the way that our work is being scrutinized and um, suppressed through the courts right now is starting to have an effect on the way we partner, the way we communicate about our work and more. Um, you know, being in Atlanta means, you know, what's happening to the Fearless Fund, which is a venture capital fund that had a fund that supported specifically black women um, has been taken to the court and um, sued and the going through appeals and uh, it's just going through the motions right now and it's flagging um, and putting a red flag on organizations that are similar that serve um, in a race explicit capacity. Um, and so, you know, this has implications in terms of our funding, in terms of, you know, the way that funders show up and support this kind of work. Um, the way that people, you know, talk about the work, you know, should we publish, you know, uh, black wealth terminology? You know, like, of course, yeah. Like, why would we shy away from, from doing this? Um, but it's starting to have a chilling effect, uh, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
we partner with an organization called the Georgia Resilience and Opportunity uh, Fund, the Growth Fund here in Atlanta, which is the country's largest guaranteed income program. Um, we're also collaborating on some baby bonds work, pilot work next year, which is you know known to be one of the best solutions to addressing the racial wealth divide. Um, but you know there is a lawsuit out in uh, the, on the West Coast that is challenging a guaranteed income program specifically for black women. And that is what Georgia's guaranteed income program is about. And so it's not just affirmative action anymore. It's about all of our work that is targeting or at least trying to address race explicit solutions. So it has not slowed us down. It's not um, stopped us from um, being explicit. In fact, it's encouraged us to lean in more um, than we ever have before. But um, the way that it's weighing on our partners and their ability to do this work is being being seen and felt um, in significant ways. So um, I, I think my challenge is just bringing people along with us and being courageous. One of our organizational values is courage, um, but also recognizing like, you know, some of us have um the ability to just be uh, have a thicker skin than others and some of us have the ability to stand out in front on the front lines while other organizations can't and you have to balance like okay we'll talk about building black wealth all day but if this partner who is much more under resourced and disinvested in in community they don't have the resources we have we'll provide cover we'll provide that you know and stand up and advocate um on on behalf of you um, where necessary, like that's becoming part of the work too. Like we've had to develop a legal defense strategy at our organization. Um, and a lot of our peer organizations are having to do that. Um, it's, it's interesting that the under organizations that are under attack by the Ed Blums of the world are leaning towards black women led organizations mm -hmm. uh, such as our own. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's interesting um, that there's not um, as much solidarity as, as we'd like to see from the rest of the black community uh, in, in this fight, um, but it is causing, it's causing some rift. So anyway, the challenge is, is, is uh, making sure that folks are prepared and resourced for this. You know, I implore if you work in the nonprofit space and you don't have a legal defense strategy or that you don't have pro bono resources, then I, I suggest that you do. If you are doing race explicit work and whenever you're, you know, applying for grants, um, that has to be a part of your operating budget um, moving forward. It's a lesson learned for us. We've not been taken to courts, but we absolutely anticipate it. So um, just just putting that out there as, as something we're dealing with in real time. No, thank you for sharing that. And honestly, like there's something to be said that if you have to start legally defending, you're doing something right in the sense of you're you're ruffling the right feathers. That's all I'm gonna say on that matter. So um I know we only have five minutes left and I tried to incorporate some of the questions that were coming through in the QA in my questions. Um, but in the last five minutes, and I know Kenyatta, you have to go to give testimony. So mm -hmm. I want to let you all kind of give you an open opportunity. Any final thoughts for for the audience here, those working in this space? Um, and Kenyatta, I'm going to throw it to you first because I know you got to go. Yeah, I, I hate to be in the the person in a rush. Nope. Yeah, you know, I think we are in a position, we're in a world where the sort of work we do is under attack, but we've been here before, right? As Black people, this is not an uncommon space to find ourselves in. Um, and the institutions that can step up right now are the institutions that are going to be remembered, right? And I think that for us as leaders, it's gonna be important that we think about what those next steps look like. We think about this as a storm that we have to you know, prepare for, but also weather and come out on the other side of, ready to build and support community once again. Uh, there was a really interesting question here about uh, the operationalization of black wealth. One thing that's interesting about our program is that as we get more ability to support Black businesses and their growth, they also support us in our growth, right? They can turn around and say, oh, I know this guy here. Let's have this conversation with this. And they can support other Black businesses and their growth along similar lines and within similar industries. So as uh, these things start to go, and you always kind of get the snowball effect, right? And I think this is what made Atlanta so amazing, is that you had HBCUs, you had leaders, you had 
uh, members of a business community that were growing. And then they were able to pull other people along and it created networks of opportunity. So I think that those networks will survive, you know, legal challenges and um, rough political uh, headwinds. And we need to think about how our organizations can develop networks and support systems where even if our work is directly attacked, we can continue to have a positive impact into the future. Um, but thank you all for having me and I will connect with everyone or anyone who wants to reach out soon. I'll reach out to you. <laughs> thank okay. you, Kenyatta. I appreciate you making the time. Nia, I'm gonna throw it to you. Sure, thank you. Any final um, thoughts? The final thoughts. Um, so. What I want to say um, is hopefully a takeaway from this um, is that there are multiple strategies. Um, I think sometimes we can kind of collectively, broadly get lost um, in conversations that kind of debate one thing or another or another. Um, and and that's trying to choose the thing. Um, that's very either or. And so hopefully uh, the takeaway here is um, there are multiple strategies, uh, there are multiple lanes, there are multiple um, addresses, uh, and there's uh, work to be done uh, in every arena. Um, hopefully another takeaway is you cannot do this by yourself and you mm. should not be doing this by yourself. Um, and so part of recognizing that there are multiple strategies, um, is also recognizing that there are, there are multiple actors. And so I talked about relationships, Alex talked about partnership, uh, and collaboration. Um, so hopefully that this, this undergirds whatever you do next, because I, I see some people asking about kind of creating things where they, where they are, uh, in the, in the questions. Um, and then finally, I do want to say, Ujima, we actually do talk about building institutions, um, but I think there's a way to think about institution building that doesn't have to be um, kind of uh, nonprofit industrial complex, which I think is sometimes what people are reacting to when they say we don't, you know, we want to put ourselves out of a job. But I do think it's, it, it is important to understand, you know, Kenyatta used the word networks, systems. Um, we talk about uh, building institutions, not just thinking about just buildings or, or organizations, um, but really thinking about endurance, thinking about sustainability. So even when we think about institution building, we are thinking about narrative work that we're doing, storytelling work that we're doing. So all that just to say, I think thinking about sustainability and endurance and proactivity, not just being reactionary, um, is important. Thank you. Sarah, I'm also going to bump it to you as well. Any final thoughts? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think uh, I've been taking notes and so I've pulled a couple different threads, but, you know, I think um, the one thing for me that is always just, um, that's always pressing uh, is one, an ecosystemic approach. I think everybody here has talked you know, a lot about not doing things alone. Um, and I think at Ujima, one of the things that we do really well, um, if you visit our website, ujimaboston.com, go to economy builders, ujimaboston.com backslash economy builders, um, you'll see all the ways that membership is mobilized throughout our um, throughout our ecosystem. Um, and so you'll see that folks are, uh, you know, delegates, voting delegates, you'll see that folks are um, leading our community standards committee, you'll see that folks are leading our investment committee and, you know, it, uh, engaging in a bunch of different ways, including our relationships um, with other folks uh, from around the country and around the world. Um, and so I think, you know, again, to echo Nia um, and Kenyatta, uh, the, just this idea that you don't have to do it alone, um, you know, and again, towards Alex, um, thinking about how we can think not uh, purely individually, um, but thinking about how we build community wealth uh, was a super important thread for me. Um, and lastly, um, you know, this is an everlasting question in my mind. It's just like, how do we decouple power from domination? Um, and what does that look like in our communities, um, especially as we think about building community wealth um, and, and what our relations look like when we're doing that? Alex? Yeah, I just 
everything that was said i have to say um somebody asked me for examples of like community wealth building and i lifted mm -hmm. up Ujima in my post on tyler perry as an example because i think um we there is still a big learning agenda around this work right like we've not scaled it people are still asking well what are the alternatives like what else is there to to, to capitalism to racial capitalism and, and more and you know my I, I say to that like open your eyes <laughs> like let's let's amplify what works what is working let's tell stories and, and build case studies so that we can help um, institutionalize you know some of this new um, this new what 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 is uh, what is actually the alternative what works um, for Black folks in particular so um, all that to say. Like let's support organizations like Ujima, like um, Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative, and others that are um, trying to build the case. Frankly, um, people don't want us to prove that this stuff works. They don't want us to prove that community wealth building is effective, and so we need to be resourced to show that it is possible. Um, so yeah, that's that's um, and, you know shameless plug at AtlantaWealthBuilding.org. Um, you know, let's lock arms. And, you know, I think our organization, uh, Mia and Sierra, like we need to come to Boston and learn with you all. Um, so I'll be following up. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, exactly. Um, I think that was one of my biggest threads too, is all of you were talking about sort of the authenticity and building trust and building relationships. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that this was an opportunity to start building relationships. You know, we focused on Philadelphia, Boston and Atlanta, but but maybe there's some solidarity and opportunity to get grow regional and to think, you know, nationwide and think about those models that are working in different places as well. Um, so, yeah, this this was really great. I really appreciate you all making the time. Um, and, and maybe in the future we'll have another conversation because I could talk about this stuff for days. <laughs> and I, I have the feeling that we could all kind of sit and learn from each other for, for days and weeks on end. So I really appreciate you all kind of making the time and sharing your expertise and sharing sort of a piece of your world with our audience. And I hope, like I said, people have walked away with a better appreciation for this work, uh, a better understanding of the challenges and successes that you've had and, and that, you know, we get you some more uh, opportunities and resources out there too. That's sort of my end goal in all this. So thank you all again. Um, and uh, we'll have sort of a follow-up sort of an email sent out with the slide decks and, and uh, we'll send some contact information so that uh, our, our attendees can follow up with any other specific questions they have for you and your organization, if that's okay. So thank, thank you so much, Mike. Of course, of course. Have a, have good, a good one. Thank you. Bye.